Yeah, excellent. All right, I reckon we just uh, we, we, we kick it off. Um, hey, everybody. My name's Oliver Bruce. I am the co-host of the Micromobility podcast along with Forrest Didu. Um, I'm sure uh, a couple of you may be familiar. Hopefully, you might have listened to the podcast at some point. Um, and I have with us today Frank Mong, COO of Helium, and Eddie Lee, uh, the former operations lead for Lion. How are you guys going today? Hey, Good. great. How are you? Oh, uh, well, I'm really well. It's early in the morning for me, but um, I'm, I'm excited to, uh, down here in New Zealand, but really, really excited to um, have this conversation. Um, Helium is, is a project I'm super excited about. So um, it's, it's great to finally have a chance to sort of like get on a call and unpack a bit of it with you, uh, with a group of people to watch as well. So, um, hey, Frank, I think probably the easiest way that we can do this is if, we, if you want to just kick it off and um, run us through. I want to give people who are kind of coming to this a little bit you know, a little bit blind or a, a little bit green, um, just the kind of the full overview. And, um, and once you've kind of done that, then we can, yeah, exactly. Great. And then um, we can go from there. Yeah, I'm ha happy to. Thanks for, thanks for having us. Um, I really appreciate it, Oliver. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just spend a few minutes to give uh, folks context for those that don't know who Helium is, give you a quick overview of who we are. And then uh, we'll introduce our good friend, Eddie from uh, former, formerly with Lime. Um, and we'll go through a bunch of Q&A with, uh, with Oliver. Uh, so let me just kind of walk you guys very quickly through Helium. Um, Helium Inc. Uh, started actually in 2013. So we've been around for quite some time. We were co-founded by Sean Fanning, the former founder of Napster, and Amir Halim. And Amir Halim uh, really comes to us from his uh, video game industry, where he was uh, actually, I think, Quake 2 or Quake 3 world champion for a while. So the two of those guys came together and they really wanted to solve a problem of connecting devices to the internet. Um, not your cell phone or your laptop or your Apple TV, but small little sensors. And the problem that we believe was that when you leave the home and you leave your office where there's no Wi-Fi and if there's no Bluetooth within the arm's length, you really don't have any option to connect devices other than cellular technology. And we all know with our iPhones and Android devices, you know, cellular data plans are quite expensive, regardless of where you are in the world. So expecting little sensors like temperature sensors or, or uh, GPS tracking sensors to have to pay a cellular data plan to operate, I don't think is reasonable, nor is the battery life of having to charge it every day convenient. And so what we did was we thought, how do we build a network that's global, ubiquitous, and low cost for everything to connect to? In comes the Helium Hotspot. You know, we launched this roughly about a year ago. And the point of the Helium Hotspot is really to, one, take everything that's open source and available out there already and build it with the intent that individuals are incented to, to contribute. And this is where the decentralization comes in. So this Helium Hotspot actually has two purposes. One, it is a wireless extender of your home internet. So if you have Ethernet or Wi-Fi at home, this will extend that range into a LoRaWAN signal. LoRaWAN, if you're in IoT, you're probably quite familiar with LoRaWAN. It's part of the LoRa Alliance, part of SimTech. They created that to connect IoT devices. It uses open spectrums around the world. And so we've adopted LoRaWAN. And what we've done is to create this incentive model to have individuals and consumers build a network, we leveraged the power of blockchain and we created a novel blockchain that has something called proof of coverage where each of these hotspots will talk to one another within kilometers or miles from each other. And in that talking to each other, it creates this ability to prove to each other that they are real, they're available, they're providing coverage for little devices. And in doing so, they're mining a cryptocurrency called HMT. And that's the incentive model for creating the network supply out there. And that's what we have done in many cities around uh, the United States and Canada. Here's our progress. As I mentioned, about a year ago, we started. We're in about 1,000 cities in North America. We've sold through now probably close to 13,000 uh, hotspots. Um, and uh, beyond North America, we're selling into Europe now. So we're actually actively selling into Europe. There's already some traffic on. It's still early days but we're roughly seeing about 12 million packets on the network per month. 
And we've got roughly 2,500 uh, or plus users, and that includes developers, enterprises, small businesses, uh, using the healing network for various applications, including micromobility, which we're here to talk about today. This is a screenshot of the map of what the network looks like. Um, you can see this for yourself either by down downloading the Helium app, which is Helium Hotspot app, or you can go to network.helium.com and you can see for yourself. This is an example of what uh, coverage could do. The blue line with the blue dot, that was me holding a, a Broon sensor. This is a Broon tabs sensor. It's a white label device, it uses GPS and uses lower WAN connectivity to send the GPS signal. And the purple dots and the purple lines are the healing hotspots in New York and Brooklyn that heard me at that moment in time. When I broadcasted, a hotspot heard me from a block away and a hotspot roughly two and a half miles away in Brooklyn heard me as I was dri driving up and down Broadway uh, in between a bunch of buildings. So that was just an illustration of that. You can use our visualization tools for free. This is cargo.healing.com. You'll, you'll probably see uh, a few thousand devices on, online right now uh, doing different things. Um, love to invite everyone to obviously to, to join the movement. Check out our website, healing.com. Join us on social media. And if you're interested in your technical, don't forget to join us on Discord. We've got roughly 2,000 members now on Discord. It's discord.gg slash helium. That's our, uh, that's our, you know, that's our link for Discord and love to see you there. And that's healing. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much for that, Frank. That was a, it was a great uh, rundown for us to, to get intro to it. Um, so look, I, I figure, um, you know, there's a couple of in interesting questions that I kind of want to like address up front um, before we kind of get into it. And, I, and, and for folks who are in the, in the chat, one apologies, uh, that was me bumping around uh, during the presentation. I put myself on mute, uh, won't have it again. Uh, and then the second is, um, if you have any questions while we're going through this, please drop them into the chat and, uh, and, and we'll, be, we'll, we'll, we'll allow ourselves to, um, to kind of go through those once we've had a couple of questions between myself and Frank and Eddie. Um, cool. Well, um, Frank, I'd love to, one of the things that um, is really interesting and I get a lot when I talk to people about Helium is they say, why blockchain? Why, you know, this is a blockchain project. You know, why do you need blockchain to be able to do this? Um, and that, and that's just a, um, I think, you know, it's, it's a word not everybody kind of understands or why it would be useful. And I thought maybe we could just really quickly at the front um, address why it is that you, you've kind of structured the network in the way that you had using that. Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the why blockchain really has to come from, you know, what problem are we trying to solve? And this sort of came about, I want to say two and a half years ago, roughly, when we realized as a company, after going through different iterations and twist and turns to find product market fit. So Helium started off as an IoT company building hardware. We, you know, over the years, I would say over the four years of life, the company really tried to tackle different point solutions, creating vertical stacks from, you know, restaurant monitoring to temperature mon monitoring to, to like smart apartment or smart building monitoring systems. I mean, you see a lot of that, you know, in the IoT world over the years. I think the, the, the challenge for us was, well, what if you leave the building? What if you leave the premises? How do you maintain connectivity for devices down the street uh, a kilometer away? H how do you monitor farm equipment across many, many acres, um, thousands of acres? H how, does that, how could you do that uh, with our technology? And really what it came down to was, you know, what we should try to solve as a company is how to connect IoT devices anywhere. And it, 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 to, make it, to make it accessible and available to everyone, regardless of, you know, whose network you're on or whose device you belong to, what if the network connectivity was ubiquitous? Meaning that you just turn on the device and it just sort of starts sending data to the internet. That, that's sort of the thing we wanted to solve. And building point solutions didn't help us solve that. And then when we asked, hey, how do we actually build a network? I mean, the answer was very obvious to start. Go get funding, right? Go raise hundreds of millions of dollars and go build a massive, you know, nationwide or global network. The same, the same way AT&T does it, right? The same way that many, I think, IoT startup network companies have done it, which is go just go build it, right? And we yeah. thought, well, that's, 
that's just people have done it. And the problem with that model is when you go expend all those hundreds of millions of dollars to do it, there's an expectation that you're going to make that back somehow. So the economics now are already not in the favor of IoT devices, right? Because you've expended so much capital and you, you essentially, and you've done it yourself, you're going to expend to somehow make that back. And I think that's the model that we think is flawed in cellular or telco approaches to IoT. While you and I, we can afford, right, to go and like, you know, pay for this thing, which the, for us in the United States, a data plan on at and I pay roughly $100 um, a month. Well, I, I don't think a temperature sensor telling me the, the temperature outside or a smoke sensor telling me there's a fire a mile away is going to pay 100 bucks a month to connect to the internet. It doesn't make any sense. The other problem with cellular is that because this thing maintains a persistent connection, I, I, I've got to like have this battery thing charged every day. This is a huge battery. It's super efficient. I love this phone, but I got to charge it every day. There's no choice. And that's part of how cellular works. And that's a flaw, I think, for, again, IoT devices. If you don't have a battery pack, you're not a car, you're not a Tesla, you're not an iPhone, like how do you maintain years of battery? You can't. You, you got to charge it. And so those two elements really kind of force us to say, all right, maybe the problem we have to solve is build a network. But how do you do that? And then I think I want to say like back in like 2017, 2018, Bitcoin, Ethereum started becoming household names. It sort of like that was massive global prominence we thought and really one of our engineers uh, at helium named bones say hey, what if we just put in bitcoin let's just put bitcoin into our helium gateways or helium hotspots maybe people will go and deploy network obviously bitcoin is very power intense and we couldn't do that so we actually went out went out and explored a bunch of different options out there for different blockchains and said, oh maybe, maybe there's a blockchain out there that we can use to help drive the growth of building a network Yep. Nothing existed with the primitives, which were important for devices, which is you got to have available coverage. It's got to be real, right? And you want to be there all the time. So th those are the premises that, that forced us to say, all right, well, then we got to go build our own blockchain if it doesn't exist. Hence the helium blockchain. We didn't, we didn't want to build it. B believe me, we did not want to spend two and a half years trying to build this thing. It's very hard. And the team did. Uh, the team built this blockchain because we felt like if there was an incentive built into the helium hotspot, individuals and consumers would essentially build a network together. But that means helium doesn't own the network. Uh, the yeah. people do. So we call it the people's network and it, it is owned and operated by the people. And they buy the helium hardware from us, the helium hotspot, because no one else would build it. Again, we try to convince others to build this hotspot. Of course, they either think we're crazy or we're liars, right? <laughs> uh, we're, we're probably more crazy than we we're definitely not liars. We're not scamming, yeah. but we could be considered crazy, super audacious. Yeah. Um, and obviously sure it, it's incredibly hard to, to make this thing work. And so we actually went through a couple of iterations where we were building a helium hotspot from the ground up, uh, our own hardware using TI as open source as we can. It is so hard, very difficult to get all the bits to work. We actually finally say, you know what, this is ridiculous. We should just use something that's already out there, which is LoRaWAN. It's already out there. It's been out for yeah. years. It's proven. There are thousands of manufacturers that, that built this, that have done it well. There are other LoRaWAN networks in Europe that are really successful, really pervasive. Why, why go do something different? Let's just build it on LoRaWAN, co-op the technology, make everything we do open source. So our hardware designs are open source, our firmware is open source, the blockchain is open source, our console to onboard things are open source. And go, let's just make it super easy, super, uh, very available for everybody, right? And that's, that's really been, been our thought. And so I think, I think early indicators say that it worked. We built a nationwide network in the United States that Simtex says is the largest public IoT network for LoRaWAN um, in a matter of months. We did it less than a year. So yeah. that tells me, right, that the economics do work in that, individuals, consumers, maybe early adopters do, do believe that this is possible. Certainly IOT experts, like guys, experts, guys have been in IOT for like 10 years. They've been, yeah. they've made a career out of IOT. They get it. They, they understand our problem and they, and they understand why we have gone down this path to create the network. They're certainly massive supporters for us. And so we're obviously very thankful for all of those that believed us. Uh, there are definitely lots of naysayers as well, and I don't blame them. What we're yeah, trying yeah, to do totally. is I mean, really insane. 
there's so much there's so much you know uh, you know as someone who's kind of watched that space there's so much crap and there's so much hype and that word in some ways is sullied and so it's always i think good yeah. to be able to kind of get in front of it and say look this is why we deployed it and and uh, you know that conceptually the reason i'm really excited about helium is that as you say it's it's built it, it sort of offloads all of the investment of building out the network to a community who then are incentivized to help adopt it right which is super just supercharges the network effects um because i yeah i think it was you maybe when we were doing quick calls around but um certainly at&t and verizon like they, they have as corporates some of the largest capex for deploying networks um you know deploying new selling networks is incredibly expensive globally you know so um, I think it's such an interesting model that you've kind of built an open source version that somebody else can go deploy, but then you make it super easy on the other side. Um, yeah. And that actually kind of, you know, pe for people who might be coming along and saying, hey, well, there are low RAWAN networks, you know, there's a couple of low RAWAN networks in New Zealand already. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. it, it, seem, it strikes me as being something like Helium makes it easy because it's like you build it once and then it works everywhere. It's not like you have to customize right. it for the local carrier in New Zealand or in the states or in the uk or wherever it is that you're selling it is that would that be correct yeah and i, I think i think part of uh what makes this interesting is the the lower WAN network as you mentioned is is available uh in many countries it's fantastic and there are lots of uh other folks building that but they're built via a central methodology right so they're all centralized networks and i would i would argue the, the majority, other than uh, the Things Network, the, the majority of the others are, are private. And, and, and Things Industries, which is part of Things Network, they have their own private networks as well, which there might be a, a good demand for, which is fantastic. But the difference here is this, where, where Helium and lower, lower, traditional lower WAN start to become different, it's because of the blockchain, we actually have something that's very unique that other lower WAN networks can't do. We, we don't need a network server. Helium is a network that's hosted by you, Oliver, in New Zealand, or Eddie in Redwood City, or Frank in San Francisco. Like any device that's compatible with LoRaWAN and can connect to Helium will be able to transmit that data. And that data transmission isn't looking for a network server to get to get back home. It just uses the blockchain. The blockchain in this case acts as a DNS. It, it sees that sensor. The data is fully encrypted. It never touches Helium's infrastructure. It's writing on the blockchain and on the internet. And that blockchain will say, you know what, that sensor belongs to Oliver in New Zealand. I'm gonna get the data and send it directly to Oliver's server automatically, all happening via the blockchain. Nobody else touches it. And in Oliver's server, you own it, you decrypt that data, right? That, that creates things in lower WAN that hasn't been possible. One, it eliminates the need to authenticate. There's no idea of like authentication of devices. There's no network server that needs to be in, in the middle. There's no man in the middle anymore. It goes from sensor to you directly, right? Yeah. The blockchain takes care of that. And it's a ledger, it's an open ledger. Everyone can see it. There's no, it's completely immutable. You can't fake it. You can't cheat the system. The other thing that's unique about this is it, we eliminate the concept of roaming. So if you're a device that, that's operating in, um, in New Zealand on the Things Network and that device, you know, needs, it ha happens to run out of the range, it's no longer in range of the Things Network and some other vendor, some telco in New Zealand has a different lower WAN network, they won't accept your info if, unless there's some kind of data treaty or data agreement, right? So you, yeah. you're, you're not gonna get your data. Helium doesn't have that problem. It doesn't matter if it's my hotspot, your hotspot, right? The audience here, we have 73 folks, their hotspot, it doesn't matter. As, sure. as long as the data speaks lower WAN and it's compatible with, the, with Helium's blockchain, boom. You can send it from anywhere, right? And so that's those are some advantages I think between what we're our our approach to creating this network, which relies on the people, and the traditional means of like the lower WAN world, I would say. And the other part of this is healing gets like we we're not charging a fee. There's no like a fee to do this. It's the the fee to connect to the to the internet via the device is a fixed amount that's built by the blockchain that charges that fee, right? So a device that wants to connect using Helium, um, let's say five, every five minutes year round, pays a dollar and five cents per year for that. And that's it. Yeah. You can't, yeah. I mean, that was the part that more, really get like, was, was like the data costs are just so, you know, like 
for comparison, right? You, you, and actually, yeah. maybe that's where we bring you in, Eddie, because I, I, you know, I'd love to talk about micromobility and how what the world looks like until now, and then why, uh, you know, when you were at Lime, why you were looking at helium. So maybe, do you want to give a little bit of a background about sort of what what you were doing at Lime and and then uh, what the the journey that you kind of took to to coming to helium? Yeah. So, um, I would, first off, I was uh, uh, one of the very first one hundred I was hired at Lime. Um, went through a lot, uh, just, you know, how, how you know, like a s small gritty startup is, you do a, you wear a bunch of hats. Uh, then later on, Scooter came into the world and I was actually the guy who launched the, the first, the launch scooter operation SF. Um, and fast forward now, as we kind of, you know, evolved even more, me, I actually, me and Frank have a mutual friend that uh, introed me to him and he had an interesting idea. I mean, I didn't even know what helium was. So he kind of, uh, ran through we were actually in his car and he was demonstrating what helium was basically similar to one of his uh his presentation you saw that little blip of that line of uh when he was in new york he wanted to show how accurate helium was compared to my cell phone where i just had my cell phone watched how, how we drove around san francisco and we compared which which was more accurate myself my gps cell phone gps or the, his helium um device and basically, while well, we were going towards Marina, I don't know if anybody on the call is from SF and they know that some areas in SF, the, the GPS is spotty. So I was looking at my phone and we noticed that we were, I was jumping around. But when I saw Frank's device, it was just a straight shot line, adjusted signal, made the frequency of the blips, you know, more frequent or less frequent. And, and practically, when, if you wanted to draw a line of how my GPS compared to Frank's, uh, to Helium, it would have been... A, a Picasso drawing and it jumped around everywhere. But for, we, but when I saw Frank's device, it was just an exact route of where we drove and then where we did like a U-turn, a, a, a three-turn park, a three, like what was it a three-turn uh, uh, re reverse. It, it, it was, it was really accurate. And I was very impressed with what Frank showed me. And then that was for me to get on. And then later on, he felt that maybe there could probably be synergy in Mark Billy. So I agreed to test with him on, putting one of the his uh, trackers on a scooter. So we met up, got lunch, and then, uh, of course, rode it with Scooter to meet up with him. And he finally showed me his uh, his tracker, which was actually, which I asked if he could show me something smaller, I'd agree to test with him. He brought in a tracker that was a lot smaller where we kind of zip tied it on uh, a scooter. And then, basically, practically, the whole plan was, once he has the tracker on there, uh, we were gonna play hide and seek. So. I took the tracker, he would count to like 30, I don't know how long, he could have counted to like 100. And I would go somewhere in SF, we were, we were, we were gonna be fair, I said, I'll just stay somewhere in Soma, uh, but anywhere is fair game. So I practically tried to emulate, you know, how anybody would ride a vehicle and see how quickly he would be able to locate it uh, with his tracker. And um, I had five different spots of mine and one had to do with me hiding a vehicle in a bush. Um, a vehicle that was on top of a tall building where, uh, you know, there's sometimes when, uh, when I wanted to rent a scooter, I thought it would be right on the sidewalk, but apparently it's um, in, inside a building on the third, fourth floor. Um, and that's, and then, so all these different locations were based off of what you would notice on the micro building landscape of where you would find the scooter most likely. And um, I was very surprised that a hundred percent of the time Frank found me. Um, and I didn't like, hide like with the scooter i just left it somewhere and just like hit somewhere else so that he wouldn't have to look for me he just needs to follow the tracker and 100 percent of the time he found the vehicle first and then i popped up and was was shocked that he he found the vehicle without you know even trying to look for me first um or pin like some type of weird gps on me or something like that uh, it was it was uh it was very very uh surprising and uh one use case that i want to actually say that was that sh surprised me the most was I did try to, you know, um, kind of uh, confuse him a bit, see how accurate it was, where I went to this garage, this parking garage that had four floors. I went to the top floor and placed the scooter closest to the edge, which is kind of more close to the sidewalk. And hid right across from the, the garage behind the car, not suspicious at all, <laughs> and, and then waited for him to come up. It took some time, but later, but then I started hearing another scooter coming up, and then next thing you know, I see Frank just come right up to the top floor, 
and just go straight to the scooter. And I'm just crossing the structure, standing. I'm just shocked at how accurate he just came up to the, exactly to the fourth floor. So to put that in context, how so how material is the problem of being of, of losing scooters when you're at line? And then how and how and what are the options like at the moment? How do they do tracking, for example? I mean, I can't speak for line now, but um, I think uh, right now generally, in the landscape, sorry, yeah, yeah, generally in micromobility landscape. Apologies. Yeah, yeah the, I mean, generally, I mean, if you think about how uh, a lot of vehicles where you want to rent right now in this day and age is, you know, it's all basically from cellular, and uh, there's times where I, uh, if I want and, and if I want to look for a vehicle, there'd be times where I want to walk up to this block, but then find out it's like several feet away. It's it's the it was exactly how uh, I saw my GPS bounce around when I was in the car with Frank comparing to helium, and um, you know there's so many things out there in this world that can um, you know not say everyone, but you think about you see Twitter. There's some people that vandalize and 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 probably pick them up and and do all these other things. I think right now what's very important was the accuracy of being able to find a vehicle and using it right away, which was very key that I wanted to look forward to Helium. Yeah, absolutely. And then, um, so have, uh, was, was it, what was the process? Did, did Lime ever end up adopting it and, uh, and putting it out as a, as a, like in any of their scooters? Or can you talk to um, me about that? <laughs> Once again, I, I don't know now, but I think there was yeah. just a lot of projects going on that, um, you know, after, you know, working, uh, testing with Frank, there was definitely something um, that could have been there, but there's just so much going on at that time when we were trying to be global and, and, and maintain, you know, trying to change how the world moved. There was just a lot of things that kind of, uh, you know, that didn't come, come to fruition with Helium, yeah. but uh, it, was, it was definitely yeah. fun testing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Eddie, like just, just to get folks context, Eddie, this was like maybe a year, I think it was almost a year ago. Yeah. When we first yeah, did this, almost maybe a, a little longer. Ago. Maybe, yeah, yeah almost, almost a year ago. But this is what things look like when Eddie was talking about how we were tracking things. Like this is basically what this is, guys, if you don't know, is like it, this is an ST um, disco board. So it's a developer board. It has um, the, the, it has the Syntec, uh Laura chip in here. And then this, this is a GPS module on top, but we, we basically use this developer kit to create this sensor. So the GPS sensor that can, has, can get a, there's a GPS antenna right here, uh, right here, and that gets the signal. And this transmits the signal to the healing network, right? So when, when Eddie and I, when we first met, he was like, dude, that's too big. Like we can't yeah. use that on a, <laughs> on a scooter. That but, was the one that was in, like, in his car. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this was over. It was it was over a year ago. We just yeah. we were testing a call it an alpha or beta network in San Francisco. We yeah. only had six six essentially equivalent helium hotspots. So we had six of these things spread out in San Francisco. Six hotspots with this thing like running around. We were able to give Eddie the data he needed. Now we were busy building a hotspot. This is. I mean, this was like, we were just trying to do what we can, right, to get this stuff. But to get, go from that to this, something yeah. like this, I mean, we, we, Helium, could not do this. This is Bro One. Bro One, an, an, a LoRaWAN ecosystem player, a manufacturer, they built this. But the, imagine this is just the casing. The guts of this is much smaller. Once we had something closer to this and we showed Eddie, that, I, mean, I remember DJ and Eddie were like, holy cow. That's definitely yeah. a game changer, right? And then, and then I'm, I guess, unfortunately, things stalled out a little bit, like spits and starts, because like, uh, unfortunately, like Eddie and DJ are no longer with Lime, so we went through a bunch of different new people. And I'm, like, as Eddie mentioned, they have lots of priorities, and the company's, you know, going through tons of change. But look, we, we still hope that, you know, even though we're delayed, we can still, you know, get back in with Lime and others. It'd be cool. Totally. Oh, one thing I wanted to add, um, during that time we were in this car uh, that also leads to why I think how he was able to find me in, on top of that fourth floor of the garage was, what I was impressed was they, you could actually measure elevation, sea level elevation from yeah. that person. Yeah, that was very impressive. I think that's how yeah. he pretty much found me on the garage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think about, you know, um, and the reason, you know, I'm excited about this for micromobility specifically is that, um, you know, if you look at what the other options are, really out there if you want to integrate gps tracking into any vehicle these days like 
Eddie, take us through what it looks like. Like, what's the stack look like? I'm sorry, can you say it again? What the... Yeah, yeah. So what's the stack look like for GPS tracking in, in micromobility vehicles today? Um, well, I don't know about now today, but from what I can recall in the, in the micromobility landscape, it's they have a, a pretty much a CCU and then there's like a SIM card using uh, either Twilio, I would say. And it's a... Uh, and, that would be the main uh, um, reader. I think it's three G or four G. That would that would bring that would populate signal, and then it would go back to the back end, and then it would repopulate the the location. I don't know whatever cadence, a few seconds, in. and then uh, the blip would have to update um, via the uh, whatever tool uh, that would need to like track the the fleet. Right. Um, yeah. I think right now GPS is just um, it really depends on how how credible the network is and um and if let's say for example if i was you know out trying to look for a vehicle in, in gps and my cell phone that or not my cell phone and then there's like some outage i think there's just going to be you know i probably wouldn't be able to find any vehicle but then with helium i think they're using this as a kind of a, a an alternate you know something something happened to my uh, AT&T network then. Yeah, so you'd use it as the backup on something like that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the data costs mm -hmm. are right. I mean, because at the moment, yeah. the, my understanding is that the data costs for running on the 3G network are sort of anywhere in the region of like four to seven dollars a month. You know, it can be that it can be that high. It depends just kind of on the yeah. on the data transfers. Mm -hmm. And so obviously something, yeah. if you've got something that broadcasts every five minutes, but it can broadcast and it only costs a dollar a year for the data. It just strikes me. Yep. Like, it's a no brainer. Of course, you'd want to integrate this. And I think about yep. not only shared, but actually like owned. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to, I, you know, my mum just bought an e-bike yep. yesterday. It doesn't have any tracking oh. on it. And it's like you'd think every insurance company in the world would say for a dollar a year, it's a no brainer. Of course, we'll track these things, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, anyway. Cool. Yeah. Well, look, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of conscious of, of, of our time and I, I want to make sure oh. that we kind of... Um, get through so so frank I, i've got to i, I just want to really um you know we we talked in the beginning about what 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 it compares to and there's two networks that i think are kind of potentially interesting that i wanted to just float with you and then we can talk quickly about what, how they compare and one is um because i've been looking around obviously you know what are the other tracking options available and that are coming down the pipe and the big ones that i can see are the apple find me program so apple's mm -hmm. you know on the back of the the phones um uh, so using Bluetooth effectively to, if you walk past another device, it, your your Apple yep. phone will pick up that that's there and then it'll broadcast it back to a network. Um, that's just been released. There's no real details on that. And the second is Sidewalk, which is Amazon. Um, so that's using the 900 megahertz spectrum up yep. to one kilometer range. And they're doing it on the back of their like Alexa devices and the smart camera yeah. and cameras and all that sort of stuff. So talk me through, you know, how do you look at that and see yourself competing in that landscape? Yeah, I think, I mean, first and foremost, I'm actually really happy. Um, the fact that both Apple and Amazon believe that connecting things outside, outdoors from your home and office is important and is a, is a problem. It just validates that helium is correct. And we're, we're look, who are, we're no one, right? Helium is nobody. We're just a little startup. And we had this audacious goal and, and this sort of crazy idea that maybe we can connect all things outdoors, not in your home with Wi-Fi or office and not having to use cellular. So the fact that first of all, Apple with their technology and, and Amazon sidewalk, which is gonna leverage ring and echo to create sort of this local network within your neighborhood is even a thing, I think awesome, number one. Number two, what comes to my mind immediately following that is, oh boy, like th those are real competitors. Like how do we, how do we, little David compete with two Goliaths, let alone one Goliath. Um, and I think the, the only thing I can say here is that, uh, thank goodness we're decentralized. <laughs> because if it was helium, absolutely. There's no question, it's game over. Uh, we have to like shut the doors or someone will have to buy us, right? But because we're public, as in we're a public network and it's not helium that owns it, but the people, it's really everyone on the call and all your friends and neighbors um, and your social media friends, if they all contributed and they all joined the effort, we are way bigger than Amazon and Apple because really Amazon and Apple are nothing if you're not for us, right? Yeah. Except yeah. in their case, they're not giving you any incentive to work with them. It's all closed systems. It's all proprietary. 
And Helium is all open source in its own by everyone, you, me, and everybody else. That, I mean, to me, that's just a, a very fundamental, I think, philosophical difference between how Helium operates and how Apple and Amazon operate. Not, I'm not knocking them. I, I have an iPhone, as you can see, and I use Amazon Prime. I'm just as addicted as everybody else. But I think when it comes to IoT connectivity, I, I, I continue to believe 100% that creating a network where it's powered and owned and operated by individuals and, and everyone is a much faster network rollout and the incentive is there to continue that network to survive all of us. I mean, that is yeah. the goal is you want something that's reliable, but that can scale quickly and that just works everywhere. And I, I, I don't think a closed system that's proprietary can go as fast as we can, especially with the power of the people. Totally. I was thinking about, um, for example, what it would be like if you had, um, uh, so the reason I think helium is kind of conceptually interesting as well is it's like, oh, hey, we've got this new, I don't know, bunch of drone trackers or something like this, right? That, yeah. you know, and, and you want to have something on the top of a mountain somewhere and to go and try and convince someone to go and leave an iPhone at the top of it on something that's effectively like a Bluetooth connection, right? Yeah. So it's only like, 20 feet of range or something is not you're not going to go and convince them to do it but if there's an economic incentive to someone to go and put these somewhere well they'll work yeah. it out you know and i and i think about it even from you know he, there is no helium network in new zealand frank i want to deploy it you know and i i look at it and i say well i should buy a bunch of hotspots and deploy it because i because i philosophically agree with it but also as well i think there's an economic incentive in me doing that as well and i just um i think that's such a conception yeah such a shift so um yeah totally totally get your points there um there is before we go into questions because we're gonna um go to questions in about three minutes so please drop your drop your questions in but um i do i just want to talk very quickly about you'd showed that original transponder what that looked like and then where you've gone yeah. to today and with because you've just yeah. released the the is it the tab the uh, helium tab? yeah yeah this, yeah. this tab though, yeah yeah totally and so those so talk, talk us through the tabs where you got to so they cost fifty dollars yeah. Um, what's the yep. battery life like and, and what's the kind of cost of data? And then where do you see it going from here? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and just, just so everyone understands, like we, we do things not because we want to build a business of like selling tabs. We're, we're not trying to be uh, a company like tile. They're, they're much better at this stuff. Not, not us. We do this because in our world of lower WAN, what we noticed is that most devices are for industrial use. So, you know, they're, they're kind of, they look more like, they look more like this. This is like a tectelic water leak detection sensor, right? They look more like this than something consumer-esque or they, they look like this, which is kind of intimidating for most people, right? <laughs> if you're not technical. And so what we find is that that's certainly true on the hardware side, but it's very true on the software interface side. So what we did was we took off the shelf Broan tabs, right? This is just built by Broan and we created a beautiful app for it so that consumers can use this. This right. will talk yeah. and, and helium hotspots will hear it and you can see it on an app. And this app is super easy, super, you know, two steps and you're done, right? And again, we're not doing this to like make money uh, or create a business around it. We're only doing it because nobody else is doing it. And then for us yeah. to like make this work, we have to again, prove to the world that if you create something useful, beautiful, easy, everyone can use it. And the, the point here is hopefully we prove, make the point and someone takes this stuff because we're going to open source all of it. Just take it yeah. and, and go, go do something with it. Go make it even better. Right. That's our point. Um, yeah. And so that, that's what that is. So this thing, if, if you weren't clear, helium tabs is $50. We're selling it only to people that have helium hotspots because right. this needs to be within miles of range, right? So if you're, if you live in the middle of New Zealand, there's no helium network. This is not useful at all. So we're not going to sell it to you because that's not the point. The point is to show that there's absolutely utility on the helium network. It's incredibly useful if you have range. Um, and if you have a hotspot, it's going to be useful. And $50, I mean, I, we're, we're not making any money on this. This is, uh, this is, you know, if you go buy this without Helium's app, it's like 50 bucks. So there's no difference. And we're, yeah, so that was, and that was the, what we do is this, we create like, where do we get to? Yeah. Where do we get to in terms of pricing? Cause I'm thinking about bill of material costs for yeah. someone who wants to build this and integrate it into their bike or micro mobility device, yeah. whatever going forward, like 
how, how, how you know where are we at and what's the cost curve going to look like yeah so so basically the the most expensive components in here are going to be the gps uh sensor and antenna um and probably you know the plastics like the build them just the, just the, the build of materials to actually get this thing to be built um, but I think the GPS components are probably the most expensive out of this anything in here. The lower chip is relatively cheap, I would say. The circuitry is all fairly cheap. The battery is probably relatively cheap. But if you were like able to say build um, hundreds of thousands of units to a million units, the cost of this should go down into like single digits. It should be less than ten dollars, right? You should be in that nine, eight, nine dollar range. Again, we're not in that business. That's like tiles business they should yep. do that not us totally. uh, and they can do it they sell hundreds of millions of those things no i mean I, i'm just thinking about it for someone like i don't know specialized or uh van mouth or or any of these other you know yeah. micro mobility owns micro mobility companies who go look for eight bucks or 10 even 15 bucks just adding it as an yeah. as an option and then saying you know hey look you can activate it and it's going to cost you five dollars a year or something like that just just purely from a it just makes sense to include it and, and, you know, activate it and then they can make ongoing software fees or something like that off it. So, yeah. No, that's yeah. Cool. And, and I think, uh, yeah, and I think Oliver, when, it, when you start, you know, if you're talking about scales of uh, specialized, right. Or Van Moo, where they're selling tens of thousands of bikes, uh, hundreds of thousands of bikes, maybe worldwide um, cost per bike becomes a big question. And then beyond that, it's beyond the, the data rates, right. You already mentioned cellular being maybe, 10 bucks, uh, you know, whatever it is, six bucks a month versus helium, which would be pennies, pennies a month. Um, it's really the cost of actually building that. I, I, I don't know the exact cost of build, building, uh, building a cellular module and integrating cellular modules into the circuitry of uh, a, a bike or scooter brain, but it, it's not cheap. I, it's not easy either. It's, it's fairly complicated. And you're talking about a lot of proprietary tools that you have to make the initial investment in. But in the world of lower WAN, it's nothing. This is easy. I mean, the guys that are experts or been in IoT on the call today, they know this is lower land and building this stuff is simple, very cheap. Yep. Awesome. Um, okay, great. Well, look, let's jump in. We've got about uh, 15 minutes or something uh, here. So I'll, I'll just read them out as, they, as they're coming in. But Howard uh, okay. asks, when Africa and Southeast Asia? <laughs> um, yeah, no, good question. So I think uh, Africa, Southeast. So when it comes to Lower Wan, the most important bit across the world is actually the, I'll call it the FCC certification, the, the frequency certification for that region. So Southeast Asia, depending on what country you're in, that government's gonna have certain regulations on what their um, open spectrums are. So in the US it's 915, in Europe it's 868, in China it's 477. I, I don't know what it is in Southeast Asia, depending on what country you're in, but that government body needs to support that. Good news is Lower WAN is global. They're everywhere. So as long as you have a, a Lower WAN device, or if you have a, 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 a Lower WAN gateway, that gateway can be Helium compatible. We, we actually are coming out, um, and we've already been doing a lot of testing on this, where if you have another branded uh, Lower WAN gateway, let's say a, a popular one is Tectelic or something, you, you could, load our quote unquote minor software it onto the device if they have enough horsepower on the CPU side, or you can host that minor in the cloud and we have all the code in our GitHub and you can convert your existing LoRaWAN gateway hardware into a Helium compatible hotspot. And right. you could do that in Africa. You can do that in Southeast Asia. Again, you don't have to use Helium. We've open sourced everything. It's in our GitHub slash github.com slash helium go get it go build go take it it's free so yeah, awesome. so when when africa and southeast asia now go go and build it yeah epic. <laughs> um there's a uh christian here frank why did you use blockchain and not some other dlt so like iot tangle or hedera hash graph yeah I, I think um the well the, the the key here was one of the things we want to make sure is uh there needed to be like a natural um way to to prove that your hotspot was real, the physical hotspot or physical compatible gateway, and it's located in, uh, you know, in downtown San Francisco. Like it, somehow you had to prove that. And I think he mentioned uh, what is uh, I, uh, IOTA, Tangle, and you know, I'm not. Uh, we're 
I'm not a, a, a blockchain expert by any means. I know more about wireless than I know about blockchain. Um, but I can tell you like the primitives that we are looking for around proof of coverage isn't in any other blockchain that we've looked at. Um, we certainly haven't looked at everything, but we did look at you know, uh, IOTA, we looked at foam, we looked at different versions of Ethereum and different applications on top of that, uh, Stellar. And the key, the key that we needed was that we needed hotspots to be able to communicate to each other and be able to say, okay, cool, you claim to be in downtown San Francisco and you claim to be at Fisherman's Wharf, San Francisco, how do I make sure that that is true? And how do I enforce that if it's not true, you're negatively incented to be here? Th those are the elements that we re really need to have. And it's a combination of blockchain primitives as well as radio waves and radio frequency. And hence, yeah. that, that's where LoRaWAN comes in. So, so I'm sorry, it's not a super technical answer because I, I don't have all the bits that I can understand, but th that's really why we didn't choose to use some some of the other, I think, maybe more popular blockchains. I don't know that's out there. Yeah, cool. Um, Richard Shepard asks, are Helium uh, hotspots geotagged? Can they be used to approx uh, provide approximate locations, address the urban valley challenge common with GPS enabled devices? Yeah, it can. Um, so one of the cool things about LoRa's chipset is that there's something called time delay of arrival built in. Um, and what that allows you to do is one, you could use GPS if you have a chip on board, we happen to have one, but you can use the GPS more as an augmentation service as opposed to the main service. And time delay of arrival means that as the hotspots there and it's sending and receiving data from each other, they leverage that send and receive delay, of, which is the physics of the airwaves to calculate approximate location. So imagine if you've got like triangulated or trilaterated hotspots everywhere that's providing that information. You can, you can use data science, collect that data, and you can basically then approximate where you are. Now, what, what LoRa has done and Simtech has done that's pretty smart is they've actually have a new generation of LoRa chips out now called the, uh, I think it's the LR1110. And that chip has Wi-Fi sniffing in it, which is fantastic, which means if they're in an environment where there's Wi-Fi, they find that Wi-Fi and they use a reverse lookup directory from Google and they can tell where that hotspot, where the Wi-Fi is. That, again, helps approximate where the, the actual lower land gateway or, or in this case, the helium hotspot would be. So those are all the data sets and elements that we can pull from. Time delay of arrival on trilateration, Wi-Fi sniffing if we have the LR1110 chip, and of course, the GPS augmentation. And so um, there's a question here from Matthew Perry. What kind of level of location accuracy are we talking about? Five meters, one foot, all that sort of stuff. Eddie, tell them. Oh, Even in our output, was, what was the accuracy? It was down to like the centimeter inch. It was, it, it was pretty accurate. I, once again, when I mentioned that when we were on that garage, I put the spirit literally at the end of, edge of the garage where it could have spoofed to be on the sidewalk. I peeked to see if Frank would even go towards that area of the sidewalk at all. Never did. Didn't even see him until I heard him come up to the fourth floor and yeah. he went straight for that scooter first. So I would, it's to the centimeter mark. It's really accurate. <laughs> yeah, awesome. And Thank mind you, you the um, elevation too. Yeah, yeah. Um, excellent. Look, uh, Laura Miller Brooks asks, um, how do you how do you all think about Helium as a solution for the digital divide? We're in DC and have at least 9,000 individuals who have devices but no access to broadband. What does this mean for a more equitable development of a smart city? So. The, uh, so first of all, let's make sure uh, everyone's clear. Our helium hotspot is not meant for laptops or smartphones or tablets to surf the internet. So today, a helium hotspot could not help with that digital divide. However, what I would say is this, and this is sort of a little bit forward looking for what we're trying to do. What we've proven with IoT networks is that the helium incentive, the helium blockchain itself, is able to create networks very cheaply, very fast. So imagine if we were able to take the Helium blockchain, separate it from the actual IoT application in this case, and applied it onto a 5G gateway or a Wi-Fi gateway, right? But all the primitives work the same. It uses LoRaWAN to sort of check each other, but the service provided is not LoRaWAN, but in fact, it's 5G coverage or Wi-Fi coverage. Now, now that does address that digital divide. Because instead of, you know, hundreds of thousand dollars for Verizon or AT&T to come and decide to install a, 
a cellular tower in your neighborhood, anyone could go build their own 5G gateway with Helium's blockchain be incented to do so and provide coverage for everyone. I mean, that's, that's definitely within the realm of, I know it sounds crazy, guys, I know. No, but no, no, it's just interesting because like crazy anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's that's an interesting one only because I know that there have been efforts in the past, right? Like, uh, what was it, Fon and uh, the other ones who were yeah. over in Europe. There was that, you know, everybody was like, but it was yeah. typically uh, uh, cell providers, people who were like actual normal telcos saying, we're going right. to kind of go back down another level and try and get an open source Wi-Fi network so that we can facilitate that. But it would never, I don't know, they've never really taken off. And this is yeah, it's an interesting one. I'm I'm keen to kind of have a look at it as well. Yeah. Um. All right. Matthew Perry asks, um, could this integrate with current IoT devices like what is offered off the shelf with companies from companies like Okai? I don't know Okai, but here's what to look for. If uh, if the device supports LoRaWAN specification 1.0.x, it absolutely can work. In the United, if you're in the United States, the only other caveat is that you want to be on subband two. For the rest of the world, it doesn't matter. As long as the device supports LoRaWAN 1.0.x, it can operate on Helium. And if just go to helium.com and search around, you'll find it, or go to our Discord channel. Someone can show you exactly how to do it. I, I don't know what Okai is, but the key here is to support LoRaWAN. It's, it's a scooter model. Oh, is yeah, it? Okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. 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 And and actually, it's really interesting. I don't know if they have that in their IoT te- IoT stack, but it's one of those things that I think um, definitely a conversation to be had in that. And and like in general, hopefully everybody on the call. Uh, I I know that there's a couple of you who who work for manufacturers, so it would be great to um, if you want to have a follow up conversation with me or with Frank. Really keen to to support that to happen. I think um, this is this holds a lot of potential. Um, we've got an anonymous attendee asking, does the tracker tab use GPS and Helium network to find location or only Helium triangulation to improve battery life? It, it can be both. So with, like I mentioned before, I, I would say if you use the, the, new, the latest SimTech technology, the LR1110, which is, by the way, very cheap. So if you're a new scooter uh, company or you're manufacturing thinking about this, definitely look into the LR1110. With that chip, I would, I, would, I would say that chip plus the Helium network coverage being available, you'll be able to use trilateration from the data collected via the lower WAN gateway, the hotspots or gateways that are compatible, and the Wi-Fi sniffing on the LR1110 uh, adds a whole, lot, whole ne- another level of just like verification, right? So if you doubt, if you're not sure if that scooter is there at the moment, you can certainly be sure that it's in a range of several different Wi-Fi hotspots via the directory lookup. So I would encourage you guys to look into that. It's pretty cool. Excellent. Um, someone was asking, when can we buy hotspots in California again? Uh, <laughs> okay, sorry. So I, I don't know if this is widely known, but we've sold out again uh, in the United States and Canada. We've been, we've sort of put a few regions on allocation. Like we think Canada, Canada can use a few more hotspots. So we've got a few reserved for that, but that's about to be sold out as well. Um, and there's a couple of states in the United States I think we're selling into. Um, I don't know, if you seriously want one, just uh, somehow DM me. I, I don't know, Oliver, how they can contact me. Uh, go to my Twitter account or something and message me on Twitter at, F, at, at FMONG, F-M-O-N-G. If you at me, I'll, uh, we'll figure something out. Maybe, maybe I can find a few, I don't know. Cool. Excellent. Um, but, but, sorry. Been... So for the, the, oh. the, sorry, the broader question. In the future, you should expect that there's announcements coming about more hotspots available or more compatible lower wing gateways becoming available very soon. So I do apologize for the for the shortage. Oh, in other words, from Mostly other manufacturers, not just from yourselves. So the other people. That, that's right. People. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Oh, super interesting. Yes. Yes. Sorry about that. Not at all. Um, have you had any interest from, so, oh, Doug is asking, do you, have you had any interest from self-driving uh, vehicle companies for mapping accuracy needs? Uh, self-driving. No, uh, we haven't talked to, uh, not that I can recall immediately if we talk, well, I mean, we, we've talked to, okay, so sorry. We've talked to companies that are in lots of businesses, including self-driving vehicles. It's not their main business. Um, but we have talked to uh, a couple of different um, entities that do have self-driving technology. Um, we are not 
actively, you know, doing any testing with them though. So if you have someone interested, ha happy to get them whatever starter testing kit they need to get going. Yeah, yeah awesome. Um, I've got a question here for Brad Wall. I'm trying to build a scooter membership cooperative co-op with a volunteer run uh, work to own program and we'd love to integrate Helium into scooters and EV charging stations. How can we partner together? Uh, yeah, just, I mean, anyone who, who has great ideas, send me an email, frank at helium.com or go on Twitter and, and at me on Twitter. Uh, we have uh, test kits. We have, I mentioned these, like these are dev kits. You can always start with this. Uh, if your region doesn't have any helium hotspot coverage, but does have lower WAN coverage, we can get, you know, I can point you to all the, the software to convert them. It's actually very simple. It's pretty easy. Nothing, nothing complicated or shattering, especially if you're, you know, building a tech uh, cooperative or anything like that. But yeah, happy to, happy to work with you guys. Yeah. Awesome. Um, there's a, there's someone here. Um, Asking, so helium type coverage is a real possibility for the new CBRS spectrum. Uh, I don't know what that is. Uh, if you could explain what that is, any, if either of you know, and then potential. I have no idea what CBR is like. Uh, okay, cool. All right then. That's a that's a question for um, Andrew. If you want to follow up directly uh, with Frank, that's probably the best way to do that. Um, and I'm just looking, I think we've got one or two more questions. Um, so uh, Matthew is asking, what are the security risks involved in having um, devices actively communicating with hubs bypassing typical security measures? Uh, so, okay, I, to me, there's sort of like two parts to security. Uh, one is sort of the device sending data through a helium hotspot going to the internet. There, there's that security. So we're talking about GPS reading, temperature sensors, smoke reading, motion detection, leak, water leak detection. Like these are the typical sort of sensoring, right? In that world of 24 bytes to like 24 kilobytes, that's fully encrypted. So there's, there, they have these hardware keys embedded in the actual device itself. The data is fully encrypted. That data stays encrypted when it hits the hotspot. It continues to be encrypted when the blockchain is doing its lookup because there's a header on there with a, what we call an OUI, organizational unique ID, that OUI tells the blockchain who it belongs to. So there's a kind of a DNS lookup. The blockchain gets, it says, oh great, this OUI belongs to Oliver. Then that packet that's fully encrypted, stays encrypted, goes over the internet to Oliver, Oliver's server. And Oliver's server has the private key to unlock that then only Oliver in Oliver's applications can see what that data is. So that's, that's one aspect of the security, which I think, I, I don't know what more you can do to, to, to secure that. It's not foolproof by any means, but so it's they pretty can darn the, secure. They can see that I have communicated data back to me, but they can't see anything of that data. So that's the, that's the, they have no idea. idea. By the way, yeah. they don't even know it's you. Oliver's identifier is an OUI. So it could be ABC. They don't know it's Oliver, right? He didn't know, blockchain doesn't know who you are. It just knows yeah. you're, you own this OUI. So, so then that's one. The other side would be the hotspot itself sitting in your home network. How secure is that? The good news is this. The hotspot doesn't have any inbound ports, all right? So there's like not really a way for you to get in there. It doesn't use IP address schemes, right? Lower WAN's not IP based. It's not your traditional IP. It's all radio waves. So it's analog to digital. So that, that really limits the attack vector dramatically. But again, it's still not foolproof. So Helium, what we've done is on the hotspot itself, we've, we've run pen testing, we've run software review, and doing it once isn't good enough. So we've solicited HackerOne and their community to run continuous pen testing against the Helium hotspot, against our, our, our infrastructure, against our console environment, which is the onboarding environment. So, a lot of components of Helium that's open source and available for anyone is constantly under HackerOne uh, community pen testing. Yeah, awesome. Hey team, well look, we're right up on time, so um, we're gonna have to jump off, but uh, for folks who wanna track you down, so as you said, Fmong at Twitter, and Eddie, how would, um, how would they track you down if they wanted to say hi? Um, I don't have a Twitter, but uh, you can reach me on LinkedIn, DM me, it's Eddie Lee, E-D-D-I-E, -E, last name Lee, L-I. Awesome. Excellent. Hey, well, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. This was a, I'm 
oh, I love this stuff. So this is really <laughs> exciting session for me. Yeah. Thank you, Oliver. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not at all. All right, guys. Hey, take care. We'll talk soon. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Thanks, Oliver. Thanks, Luke. Yeah. Thanks, Eddie.